Great. So welcome, everyone, to the session on restoring economic growth. I'd like to quickly just introduce you to everyone who's going to be speaking today. Uh, we have uh, Martin Jabubowski, who's chairman of Sea Wind Ocean Technology in the Netherlands. We have Alexander Malaket, president of Opus Advisory Services International in Canada. We have Orlando Remedios, chief executive officer of Sensonity in Portugal. And we have Francisco Sanchez, former U.S. Undersecretary of Commerce for the U.S. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, it's a tough topic. Um, it's probably a topic that most people are finding very relevant right now, how we restore economic growth after a post-pandemic. And I would just like to jump straight into um, the first question, which is a sense that a lot of people think that this is an artificial economic downturn, that it's been imposed on us by a virus, not by market forces. And I think that's a very interesting uh, aspect to look at because it's not anything to do with market fundamentals. Um, does that mean we will bounce back uh, faster and, and better? Um, or has there been permanent damage done to world economies that need all kinds of other strategies? So I would like to um, ask uh, Francisco Sanchez just to kick off with his opinion on that particular topic. Well, thank you, Grant. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be with all of you, uh, especially this distinguished panel. Um, if you look at uh, IMF projections, World Bank projections, um, the picture looks generally pretty rosy in 2021 and 2022. Um, world growth projections for 2021 stand at about 6% in, um, for the world. Uh, for advanced economies, uh, about 5.1% uh, is projected growth uh, for the United States, where I am. Uh, about 6.4, uh, and for emerging markets, it's about 8.6% 8, 8 in 2021. The numbers drop a little in 2022, but they still look pretty promising in 2022. Um, what's less um, um, uh, glowing or, or promising, if you will, uh, is that this growth is not necessarily uniform uh, from country to country, particularly uh, with emerging markets. And uh, one of the driving de uh, determinants of where that growth is diverging uh, is the number of uh, vaccinations that are being made. Uh, clearly, and, and this would fall under the category of lessons learned, uh, the most important thing that we could do to turn the economy uh, around and, and get it back on track is stemming uh, the pandemic, stopping the pandemic. And uh, the most effective tool we have for that is getting people vaccinated. And you can clearly see a connection to projected growth rates and the rate of vaccinations in countries. Um, so I, I would say, number one, one lesson learned is that um, above all else, we need to learn how to stem the, the, the tide of a pandemic uh, not just try to get the economy moving again if we don't have uh, health conditions under control. And then I would say let's, we need to look at five things uh, going forward to see where we end up. Um, number one is in supply chain management. I think there's going to be an ongoing deba debate over um, resiliency versus efficiency. Uh, we've, we've teetered over to uh, efficiency for the last 10, 20, 30 years, I think that's going to shift forward. Number two, um, the competing economic uh, models of the United States and China, or I'd say China and the West, and how that uh, relationship moves forward. Number three is how we imagine capitalism going forward. This is especially true in the area of trade. Uh, there's clearly been a, bla a, a backlash in many countries, including the United States, on globalization. And I, I, I think we're going to need to look at more directly how does trade benefit or hurt uh, the average citizen, the average worker. Um, and fourth is climate. Climate is going to be a, a dominant force uh, in government policies going forward, uh, as we think about the economy, I think they're going to be forever, uh, connected in ways that have not necessarily been the case. And finally, uh, we've got to see what happens with, with inflation. 
and whether or not it has an impact that um, that is uh, worrisome or not. And I, I think I'll stop there so that uh, others have a chance to talk. Great, thank you. Uh, Martin, I'd like to come to you. You're based in the Netherlands, all plugged into the European uh, economics. Can you tell us what you're seeing from the European perspective? Yeah, actually, the company is based in the, in the Netherlands, but we are an international company working from New Zealand over Singapore, um, India, um, uh, Greece, um, Italy. I am in Portugal, actually, not in, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, because we will deploy our prototype in Portugal, over to Ireland, um, USA, Canada. So we are, we are all over the planet, and the company is established in the Netherlands only because you need to be somewhere, let me say like this. From a European perspective, I would say that it is a huge opportunity which we have. It is an artificially imposed crisis, for sure it is. Um, but at the same time, if there is something positive, and I believe there is, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a warning. It's a warning before we come to the next crisis, which is linked to the climate, uh, climate change, which will be much, much, much heavier than, than, than COVID-19. So I see it um, as a very positive uh, event for, for the world if finally, but I'm not sure if that is true, if finally mankind starts reflecting on its, uh, uh, on its responsibility. Uh, I mean, after World War one and World War One and Two, we had that it was imposed again to reflect, and again uh, COVID is uh, nothing nothing comparable to World War. But if we don't put these fundamentals in our um, politics about um, sustainability and responsibility, which we have for the planet, um, we will get a, a bigger crisis. So I, all in all, I don't see big problems. I don't see big um, big changes coming out of uh, of COVID-19. Now I'm Germany. In Germany, it was handled pretty well, but not only in Germany, also in the Netherlands and uh, in other countries. So we have enough financial resources to cope with the one, two years of uh, lower uh, uh, um, employment and, and less jobs and so on. I don't see big, big drama in this. Uh, the, 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 the point I would like to make is that this is just a warning, it's just a warning which we shall, on which we shall reflect to, for the next bigger crisis coming if we don't drastically, drastically switch, switch our energy politics and, and energy is the basis of all economic uh, uh, actions. So if we don't do that rapidly and drastically, we will come in 20, 30 years, become a much bigger crisis. So that, that's my learning from the small crisis, so I don't see it as a, as a big drama, not at all. Thanks, Martin. And uh, talking about long-term perspective on crises, I heard the other day somebody say that we still haven't recovered from the 2018 uh, downturn. So, um, Alexander, would you like to, to talk about that, about a long-term view? Um, you know, we're talking about looking towards the next crisis already, but some of the previous crises haven't been resolved yet in some people's eyes. Um, do you have any opinion on that? Yeah, I do. Thank you, Grant. And likewise, uh, as Francis, Francisco said, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you and, and the folks who are, who are joining us on, on, on the panel here. Um, so I think there is something to that. The 2008 crisis took us a decade to sort of get back on top of things from an economic perspective, certainly from a financial sector stability perspective. And it was a much narrower crisis and a much more specific one that we understood uh, so we, we knew where it came from. We could get our arms around the order of magnitude of the size of the crisis. We could put regulatory and compliance measures in place to mitigate the impact of the toxic mortgage assets. Uh, this one is much more complex, uh, and, and it, you know, it's got the, 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 the horrible you know, health uh, crisis, the public health crisis dimension, together with the economic crisis that we're all facing. And as much as I agree with the characterization in a sense that it is artificial in quotation marks, I think it's um, this a sign of, of the nature of crises to come, being complex in nature and multidimensional in nature. Um, in terms of the, nature, the, the, the call for us to, to consider on this panel in terms of recovery and resetting, um, I would agree, again, with Francisco's observation that, that trade will be an important part of that dimension. I think it's one of the few global policy levers that we have to 
whole and that we can coordinate in a useful way. Um, and the other thing I wouldn't want to lose sight of is the role of the SME segment. Um, SMEs are economic drivers almost without exception around the world, whether you're an emerging market or an OECD economy, and they are currently suffering the most from an economic perspective. So when we look at things in where I live, which is the trade space, when we look at supply chain, when we look at liquidity across supply chains, we are and we need to be more concerned about the so-called long tail, not long tail of the supply chain, sort of deep tier financing and deep tier management of those supply chains. Um, I'll just observe that there is a debate that's interesting, which is this discussion between um, deglobalization and what um, Bob Koopman over the WTO, chief economist there, calls it reglobalization. And I tend to lean to the reglobalization perspective rather than the deglobalization, because the mathematics of full deglobalization just don't make sense. They won't sustain it. Um, as a colleague of mine said in, on a recent panel, you can't move a billion dollar semiconductor plant out of Asia just because you feel like it or just because you declare a policy that that's what happened. Um, so the deglobalization argument, I think, is the, the more compelling one for me. And that has implications for us, both from a commercial perspective and from a policy perspective in terms of how we look at that, how we address it, how we offset things like economic nationalism and, and what we saw, you know, traces of vaccine nationalism that are very, very dangerous. And actually, you know, not only a, a of, of poor service to the global community, but not at all self-serving either. If you believe the, the observation that none of us are safe until all of us are safe. So, you know, one of the things that this has shown us is the interconnected nature of the world today. So as much as you might push against globalization for various reasons, and there are reasons trade is imperfect, the, the, the distribution of value has been imperfect. So we can learn from those experiences and try to do better going forward. But the reality is that there is this huge interconnection as we saw from a public health perspective now, as an economic uh, reality that we, we're becoming more and more conscious of, and certainly as a trade reality. So these nationalist sort of knee-jerk reactions are, are dangerous and not at all constructive. And so those are the sorts of things from a reset and recovery perspective that I would want to shine a light on in a, in a discussion like this one. Great, thank you. And Orlando, I would like just to come to you and uh, ask you about stimulus packages. <clears throat> Obviously, uh, from country to country, there have been various responses. Um, America has had a, a huge stimulus package, which is ongoing. Um, are these good things? Um, do they set things up for future problems, or do you think that they are necessary? And what is the role between uh, stimulating, uh, you know, top-down approach from, from government downwards to business um, jumping in to take advantage of the benefits of the stimulus package? Mm -hmm. I think uh, what the United States did was uh, really great in terms of uh, stabilizing uh, the, the situation. What we see in Europe, the stimulus package is coming late. It should have been here already. It was decided Almost a year ago, it's still not yet executed in the uh, in, EU, in Europe, and uh, I think uh, we could actually bounce back quite uh, quite fast if we would have had already the single packets executed in Europe. So uh, I believe that um, very soon, with the operationality of the stimulus package in Europe, we will start uh, seeing seeing bounce back in Europe. But of course. Uh, Global trade will will suffer uh, from basically the, all the inefficiencies that we saw during the COVID pandemics and uh, the shortage that we see now in semiconductors. I think they they really show that uh, supply chains uh, need to be resought, resiliency brought into into them, and uh, this kind of approaches uh, really should be incentivized right now. And we see that in the European stimulus package, we have actually the resilience part, the, the um, climate uh, change activities, they are uh, what uh, is basically funded by the stimulus package. So I think it goes in the right direction. It comes a little bit late, but uh, nevertheless, stimulus package helped, uh, helped the United States stabilize, helped stabilize actually the rest of the trade and uh, will help uh, as well when it gets uh, started in Europe. Great. And I'd just like to open the next question to anyone on the panel to answer is um, the fact that there are so many different solutions coming from different parts of the world. Each country, each region has reacted very differently. 
And one of the questions we've been asked to address today is which economic uh, approach or strategy will prevail post-pandemic? If there indeed will be one, there might be multiple. Would anyone care to comment on what they think would be the most prevailing strategy? So in, in, in the silence, I'll, I'll take a chance and jump in on this one and see how much trouble I get myself into, <laughs> um, which, is, which is to say that I, I'm not sure it's a question of one prevailing over another. I think that it's a progression, and I think um, the various systems at the extremes are progressing to something different. So whether you think about a, a purely communist system or a purely capitalist system, I think both extreme perspectives are realizing that that's probably the extremes are not the answer. Um, and, I, you know, I illustrate that in, in, in the trade world again, um, in terms of the recovery and the building back better, which is like getting to be a slightly tired phrase, but it makes the point. One of the things that you can point to is the increasing attention being given to ESG, environment, social and governance factors, almost without exception, whether it's in the commercial environment, whether it's public procurement, whether it's policy, whether it's the hard-nosed sort of Wall Street investment banker. I mean, Larry Fink is like the, the flag carrier for ESG in, on Wall Street um, and with great credibility. And so I think that illustrates the way that we're trying to find some kind of a balance between some of the, let's say, economic doctrines that you might think about and some broader questions that we need to be thinking about as a global community. Um, so I think probably that's how I would position it rather than saying it's a one prevailing over the other. And then the other point I might make is this is an ideal circumstance, and I use the word advisedly, to once again champion the value of multilateralism. And, you know, sitting sitting up here in Canada, we're delighted to see the change. I will say for myself, I'm delighted to see, see the change of tone coming out of Washington, the desire and the interest to engage uh, multilaterally. Um, I was just on a sustainable finance uh, call with the G20 last week or the week before where China and the United States are co-chairing the establishment of this work under the Italian presidency, uh, which I think is a very important step forward. So that's, I, I, would, I think I would position it this way, is, is the discussion around multilateralism and thinking about some of the broader issues like ESG that come to the fore in this discussion. Grant, uh, to, to, to build on Alexander's comments now and earlier on trade, um, there's data to suggest that the countries that are uh, most integrated in supply chain, whether it's through regional integration or global integration of supply chains, um, are going to uh, <clears throat> return economically faster. And so I, I think that does speak to Alexander's uh, comment earlier about the role of trade. Um, and going forward, uh, the role of multilateralism, uh, looking at our trading system now, and figuring out how we can make it fairer, how we can make it work for average citizens and workers, but recognizing that it has an important role to play in economic recovery uh, because the data is there, that the, the more integrated you are, Mexico, the United States, and Canada is a good example, uh, that you have integrated supply chains in aviation, automobiles, um, and other areas. And because of that integrated supply chain in a number of industries, I think you're going to see Mexico's economy, uh, the U.S. and Canada um, come back, uh, and in part it will be because of that. Right. Uh, Martin, I just want to ask you, uh, you seemed pretty upbeat earlier in your opening comments around uh, the economy and things bouncing back. Do you see this as a bounce back to th what things were? Uh, do you think that we are irreversibly changed towards a new way of doing business in the world? Or do you think things will get back to what they were pretty quickly? I believe there will be a, a huge change, starting from Europe, starting from Germany. I believe that in Germany now, with the Green Party getting almost 30% of the voters, there will be a huge change. This will expand over, over, over many other European countries. And I believe also that we need to react, uh, because this was a warning, as I said before, we need to react in setting... Um, parameters for this future uh, rebounds. Um, after after uh, many of these crises which we have had in the past, um, we need to have some guide guidelines. Uh, Keynesm, uh, Keynes, uh, he was uh, was uh, bringing back the function of, of the government in, in stimulating growth. I am not of the opinion that this has to be 
like um, like like Kane said it before, but we need to come to common goals set, for example, like CO2 price for the CO2 emissions. If you don't come to these kind of things, like the price for CO2 emissions, <laughs> there will be no sustainable growth in, uh, on a global level. And that's the only thing we have to, 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 to go for. So there has to be international cooperation in setting those goals and also setting rules. Independently from what the system is, if it's, uh, it's, if it's a capitalistic system or, or um, so-called communistic, it has nothing to do with communism, but okay, state, uh, state control, let me say like this. But we need to set those common, some common goals and also have mechanisms in place and the, and the pandemic has exactly shown that if we don't have those um, uh, mechanisms in place, it, it, there, there will be disasters, and the big disasters will be bigger. They are programmed. They are programmed. And, I mean, mankind never learned. In, in, uh, in the entire history, never learned. Never, never there was a learning from a crisis. Everybody just want to grab as possible, um, to, to, to make as much money as possible for, for the next uh, part of his life or, or, or his community. So I don't see mankind learning. Uh, but uh, at least we have to try to put those mechanisms in place uh, in order to set common goals because the next crisis will be much stronger than the COVID crisis. So this setting common goals and make sure that they can be uh, that they will be respected by, by any system in any state is a fundamental task. Great. So you you spoke about capitalist and socialist type systems, but I'm seeing the emergence of a third, which is digital which seems to be nonpartisan. And, uh, you know, we've seen the last year during the pandemic how the companies that have really thrived have been online and digital companies. But at the same time, we're seeing a great threat from ransomware attacks, especially in the U.S., around the world. Um, Orlando, what is your opinion about the rise of the digital economy? And do you, do you see this as a short-term trend based on the pandemic and everyone being more inward-looking and homebound and needing these tools to survive uh, with with uh, companies working from home, um, is this a short term trend, or do you think things are irreversibly now heading towards a digital future? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that there there are reasons for for a, a more digital future than uh, we had in the in the past. Really, several companies found out that they can work uh, remotely uh, as opposed to the to the past. But it's also clear that a lot of companies which will uh, reconvene again and, and uh, start working together again because um, there are industries where uh, the remote work really is not as conductive to to um, to innovation or productivity as a remote work. And uh, we have seen to, throughout uh, the last 18 months that really several uh, companies really struggled to, to innovate during the pandemic, but we also saw that uh, companies who managed uh, to still work together and, uh, and to help their, their team and together were able to, to move faster so that there was actually a, um, an increase in productivity for companies who were able to, to still work together. But uh, I believe that uh, a lot of companies uh, will will allow their employees and their workforce to continue to to stay at home and uh, to to continue work uh, remotely as opposed to to the previous uh, settings. We see, that, but we see already that the large uh, tech companies Google, are are already planning the um, the return dates for for their for their employees. So. There is really in the high tech area, uh, there is really the, the need for this additional communication, which only can be achieved in an office or in a, in a campus. Would anyone care to comment on what they think the biggest economic lesson has been of the last year in terms of a positive outcome? Hey, Grant, do you mind if I just add one more observation to the sure. digitization discussion? So I think it's sure. a very germane one. Um, and it's two things. First, I have to say that Martin almost made me stand up to pour myself a double scotch because I'm really hopeful that somehow we learn from something. Because if we don't, I don't really know. Well, I, 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 hope, I hope you're 
all respect, I, I, I hold on to the hope that maybe we do. <laughs> um, so, so I'll do the scotch later on. But, but the comment I wanted to share was around digitization. So in my, in my world, one of the areas we focus in on is the financing of international trade, which in certain techniques is extremely paper and process intensive. Uh, but what happened at the early part of the, the, the crisis, the pandemic, is that there were literally thousands, if not even a couple of millions of sets of shipping documents trapped in warehouses in India and China that Purelater and FedEx and DHL and all the others couldn't get to. And therefore, the financing process that required access to those documents and verification of them briefly ground to a halt. Where I'm coming to is the industry came together very, very quickly to say, okay, hang on a minute. We can't be the, the, the reason why trade doesn't happen. The economic value of this is too important. And suddenly, within a par- period of a couple of months, we resolved issues around digitization of finance and trade that we've been talking about, no exaggeration, for 30 years. Uh, and so, you know, there's a discussion in, in our industry that says the pandemic probably accelerated our ability to digitize our business by at least five years. So I think there's there's some real rays of positive sort of progress in the digitization discussion. Um, your positioning of it in the question of saying there are you know two traditional political or socioeconomic and political models, and then there's the digital one. I would just point out that crypto might be the, the epitome of sort of trying to create something separate. And I'll just mention that the recent pronouncements from China basically took the bottom out of, out of the crypto market. So I'm not so sure that they're quite as disconnected as, as might, one might think they, they are. Uh, so those realities I would just keep in mind. Uh, I would add to that that the digitalization process has been accelerated. So no doubt. We did, we did digital communications, uh, communications even before COVID because we had money. We couldn't afford to travel. So we, our workspace was Microsoft Teams. The, the good thing of COVID was that now everybody does it. No need anymore to meet, meet. no need anymore to sit face to face. So it helped us a lot in promoting our model and this increases efficiency tremendously, tremendously. It is clear you need senior people, you need responsible people, you need to have a, a certain, yeah, responsible, I would say, way of, of working. But if that is implemented, the productivity, the productivity is increasing tremendously, much less loss of time, waste of money. So it's a huge step forward. It's a huge positive effect. Grant, uh, if, if I may make comments and, and Martin, at the risk of piling on, um, I, I too have a more optimistic view of uh, <laughs> the world learning, uh, not necessarily just from the pandemic, but generally. I sit on a on a publicly traded board. Uh, I'm starting my eighth year, and I can tell you that uh, seven and a half years ago, uh, the amount of time that we dedicated in board meetings to ESG-related issues was negligible. And uh, I attended my last board meeting about four weeks ago, and I would say about 30% to 40% of our time touched on ESG-related issues, one piece of data. Um, another piece of data is what happened to Chevron uh, about 10 days ago, where investors uh, are, are demanding that companies pay attention to climate issues, to ESG issues uh, generally. Um, and and uh, these investors had uh, two board seats, uh, one, two board seats uh, with board members that are going to have more uh, focus on those issues. So on the business side, I do think that there is a, a, a shift. And, and then if you just look at what's happening in in transportation industry, where there is clearly a move to electric vehicles, to hydrogen fuel cell technology, and and other cleaner approaches. So I I um I don't think you need to drink that scotch for uh, depression. Uh, Alexander, you might want to drink it and toast that we're, we're moving in the right direction. Um, and, and then uh, in going back to the question that you asked, what what are we learning from the pandemic that we can take with us? I, I think one thing that may come from this is a hybrid approach to working where we're not going to completely give up the office, but some combination of working in the office and working from home. And, and I believe it can increase productivity. I think it can be more inclusive of, of um, 
workers with with children who if you if you look at one of the biggest challenges again in the company that i serve on the board on one of the biggest challenges that workers have is child care and so i'm not saying this is a uh, a panacea for for dealing with that but i do think that we may come up with uh, a more uh, diversified approach to how we work and uh, and i'm optimistic that it actually end up being more productive for us and, and actually one more thing for me grant if i may and that's to i feel obliged and as a fellow african you might you're, you're going to probably feel with me on this i was born in addis ababa so i feel obli okay. obligated to bring the voice of the emerging markets to the discussion to say that, um, one of the things I think we should be conscious of as we drive forward, I mean, this panel is, is very sort of OECD um, skewed in a sense, but but that whole, and Francisco, you made the point in a couple of different guises, this inclusion and inclusiveness discussion, right? I think that's something that we really need to bear in mind uh, as we look to a global recovery. So, you know, the, the African continental free trade agreement, I think, is going to be a game changer for the continent and for the region. Um, I think the last piece of data I saw suggested that something like 17% of trade flows only were intra-Africa. So those countries have a lot of potential upside uh, to, in sorting out the trade flow challenge. Um, that has a lot of implications for infrastructure and finance and all sorts of things. But, but there's, a, there's a big win to be had there in the context of that new trade agreement. And so, and you know, you think about things like the, the trade, what we call the trade finance gap. There's one and a half trillion dollars of unmet demand per year for trade-related financing, most of it is concentrated in, in developing and emerging Asia with SME suppliers in those global supply chains we've been talking about. So there are areas where we could really hone in and really have create a kind of a multiplier effect in the recovery and in the reset uh, post-COVID. Right. For sure. For sure. There's been quite a big uh, awareness around the fact that that I heard somebody the other day say the world's first trillionaire will be somebody fighting climate change. That the people who are going to be the future billionaires and, and trillionaires will be people who are coming up with solutions. And so the sort of awareness, it's been a crazy year. It's not just been the pandemic, as we all know. There's been social unrest. There's been all kinds of awareness uh, on social impact and social issues around the world. And these seem to have been converged on top of the pandemic and, and economic downturn. So... As things bounce back again, um, how important is it to introduce social impact and social awareness into economic growth recovery? Um, and where do you see that going? Um, it seems as if the, the new business opportunities in the world will be for people who are and companies and brands who are addressing world problems rather than just looking after their shareholder interests. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, Grant. And I can witness that because. Um, I have been 18 years through the through the valley of death, 18 years. I'm working on this floating wind turbine solution since 20 years, only in the last two years, only in the last two years. And I can tell you, in the last year, things have been speeding up tremendously. In the first three or four months this year, just we have such a strong tailwind now, it's unbelievable. So there is no doubt that I can witness what you are saying, that... that um, the, our company is uh, co completely dedicated to developing this technology which can produce green hydrogen at a cost comparable to gasoline. Just made the mess uh, again today for, for somebody else. If we take a Toyota Mirai and put our green hydrogen, we, you, you will drive cheaper than with today gasoline prices with our offshore wind turbines, huge wind turbines. So the technology is there. My pe pessimism was a little bit instrumental, I have to admit. So uh, you don't need to drink the scotch. I'm, I'm optimistic, and if I would not be optimistic, I wouldn't have made a, a march through the valley of death for 18 years. Huh? So it's a long, it's a long time. It's a long time. So I'm very optimistic that there will be a strong development, exactly in the direction you are saying, right? And uh, I can witness, I can witness it uh, from our company, from from my own life. That is the future, and uh, we are getting so much support now. We are dealing today with two of the top five oil and gas companies and several others, EPC contractors, which are in the top ten. So it's really something happening in the last year, I would say, which I would not have expected, uh, not in my, not, not, not in my, my, 
my most uh, uh, dreams, uh, most advanced dreams that this would happen so rapidly as it is now. And again, I believe COVID has a big role in this. It is a global reflection which is going on on, on what are our priorities and companies who are betting on this will have a very strong development and that very strong development will again create a lot of jobs uh, everywhere everywhere just it's, it's, it's everywhere it's not uh, linked to any country or any region so there, there is absolutely this situation yeah i mean uh, I, I would even come back to francisco's point earlier illustrating how much time his board spent on esg issues right i'm 57 and as if i don't have enough to do, I decided to go back to school and learn something about ESG. And there's a tremendous program, I'm not worried about plugging it, called Competent Boards um, that has fantastic content. And these are, you know, top tier global CEOs and, and board members talking about how this has become central to their conversation. Um, you know, to come to your question, Grant, around will it be important to inject the social dimension to the recovery? I, I think it's critical and it's almost inevitable in a sense. I mean, we're, we're having conversations now about the debate between what is the purpose of a corporation? You know, what's the social license to operate? How does it fit in the broader community? How does it prosper among those it serves? Um, so those conversations almost inevitably lead you to a broader conversation than a bottom line to the old triple bottom line or whatever we're calling it these days. Um, but but there is there is there is an impetus now for that. There's an urgency for that. And the one caution I would offer on this panel is that we, we need to watch out against backsliding. So there are some well-intentioned comments. There's some motivation for us to have these conversations now in, in midst and hopefully in many places, but not all at the tail end of this health crisis. But we need to, I think, be vigilant against backsliding and and, and forgetting what we, we we started to commit to do in terms of some some more thoughtful approaches to some of these issues. Sorry, Martin, you wanted to say no, something? No, go on, go on, no, yeah, and also seeing the task which we have in front of us, because renewable energy today is a tiny little fraction of the energy production, a tiny little two or three percent. It's tiny little. So if you want to substitute more than 95% of fossil energy. It's a huge, huge, gigantic task uh, from all points of view, so financial, uh, social, whatever you want. So we are not even in the beginning, I would say, not even. Great. Um, Orlando, I wanted to ask you, just in relation to Alexander's point about backsliding, what kind of strategies uh, or thoughts have you got on how to prevent that backsliding from lessons we've learned I believe if we look into into the past, we see that uh, and the last uh, 40 years we have been evolving, perhaps not fast enough, but we have been evolving on the on the path to to sustainability. So for sure, um, as uh, as um, already mentioned, some some countries. Uh, so Martin mentioned that in Germany, uh, the um, the Green Party is poised to, to become the, the most voted party in, in Germany. If we imagine that uh, it's a, a super industrialized country and, um, and basically the Green Party has at the, at the moment the, the, the highest, uh, the, the highest uh, polling uh, rates in Germany, that shows us that the, um, that the, the at least uh, in some countries we have already the the mindset uh, looking into into not backsliding and into evolving and so we see that a lot of systems uh, were already in the past set up even without any any major crisis and now a lot of people really get to see get to see what what the crisis like covid can bring and in Europe and the US, uh, I believe that uh, people have not been so affected by COVID as in other countries because of stimulus packages, because of uh, of um, of uh, state uh, help. But if if we see what really people have learned, I believe that uh, they will use the next five to ten years really to to improve systems, and we can we can build on the legacy of what uh, was already done in the last 40 years to do even better in the next years. And I see that happen. Right. We have five minutes left of this panel, and I just wanted to quickly ask for closing comments. If each of you could please give me your most immediate uh, strategy for 
economic policy for the next few months ahead? What would you suggest? And we'll start with you, Alexander. Thank you. I was hoping for 30 seconds to think about my answer. <laughs> um, look, I, I think I'll boil it down to collaboration. I think the economic policy has to be um, thoughtful and, and, and stretch a little bit in terms of the vision that's under, underlie, underlying it, um, while at the same time as looking at the practicalities of what needs to be done on the ground. Um, one of the conversations I've had with some people in France is to say, look, the standards by which we measured acceptable financial performance pre-COVID can't apply during COVID, and they probably can't apply for some period after COVID, meaning things like deficit financing, which we all shy, you know, shied away from pre-crisis, we need to use that as a mechanism today. So some of that policy thought, I think, will have to stretch the bounds of comfort to be effective. Great. Francisco, your thoughts? Uh, I would start with something that is uh, in some ways non-economic. Uh, but making sure that uh, emerging market countries have access to vaccinations. Uh, and I think that particularly falls to the United States and to Europe, uh, as well as, as China, um, because as I think Alexander put forward in his opening comments, that, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase you because I can't remember the exact quote, but if, um, if any of us is not safe, n none of us are safe. And I think by analogy, uh, if, if there are uh, big parts of the emerging market economy that is um, at risk of not bouncing back because they're still fighting the pandemic, it will eventually hurt everyone. And so that, that would be number one. Um, number two, I would say, too, uh, cooperation, particularly in finding new ways to think about trade that allows for economic integration, but in a way that really does benefit workers and citizens in ways that have not always played out that way for large parts of populations. Right. Thank you, Sanchez. Uh, Orlando, your closing thoughts? Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that uh, given given the current uh, current situation, if we are fast enough in executing, for instance, in Europe, the resilience package. If we are, go ahead with the Gavi, so if the, the donor states give to Gavi really the access to the vaccination that they can execute the vaccination program all around the world, we are actually um, in a quite a good position to, to rebound after such a, such a crisis. Um, and I'm quite uh, actually positive that we will achieve that. Great. Uh, Martin? Well, you can guess, put a CO2 price uh, globally. So it will stimulate huge economic growth, huge economic growth, just swap a, a huge amount of, of, of money and value from where it is today to a new, um, uh, to a new way of producing and a new industrial production. And we have seen that in the past, that will automatically generate wealth all over the world, be it in industrial countries or in developing countries, such a, such, a, such a move. It has to be done in an intelligent way, for sure, but it can be done in an intelligent way, but it will be a huge stimulus for uh, economic development, not, not what everybody is saying, um, a, a great burden on the population. It's the contrary. Uh, I'm about among the founders of the foundation of the Green Party, not the Green Party, the foundation of the Green Party in Germany, and they all wanted to have, you know, um, stimulus packages for renewable energies. Now, I'm since over 30 years in the renewable energy, said, no, we don't need stimulus for the renewable energy. What we need is simply a CO2 price. Why shall we have the black heater in our hand while the others are polluting and getting even incentives for that? So it's, it's, it's just not an uh, even playing field. If we get an even playing field, there will be a huge economic revolution, economic revolution, through this uh, ec ecologic instrument. Great. Thank you, Martin. Um, our time is now up, and thank you, everyone, for your input today. I think uh, the tone has been upbeat. It hasn't been doom and gloom at all. It seems like there's lots to look forward to. The challenges are certainly there, but uh, there certainly are plenty of great ideas and strategies to, to make things work. Um, so thank you all once again. Um, and uh, 
look forward to seeing you for the rest of the harasser sessions. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.